Hey, this is DJ Jazzy Jeff. And I'm Aida Osman. And welcome to Bel Air, the official podcast from the new Peacock original series, Bel Air. I am so excited to dive into the show. And we'll be joined by some amazing guests like the show's creator, Morgan Cooper, and so many more people. It's a culture podcast. Yeah. It's a TV podcast. Yeah. But it's not a recap podcast. Period. Subscribe now and listen to Bel Air, the official podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us your attention, we need everything you got fast Waiting on reparations, we be the illest podcast Tune in every Thursday, politics and wordplay We fight for the people cause they got us in the worst way From the hill to Brazil, Bombay to Kanye From the left enclave to what the neocons say Every Thursday, cop the heady conversation And, and break us off with some bread cause we waiting, waiting on, on reparations. reparations Listen to Waiting on Reparations on the iHeartRadio app Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts I'm XD. And I am Jade. And we're Jade and XD. Our podcast is The Blackest Show About Nothing. I think a great podcast is rooted in doing what you love, and you'll be rewarded quite handsomely. Yeah. Working with Spreaker, the monetization portion has been a really wonderful experience. You want a podcast full time and follow your dreams? Then hit up Spreaker.com. S P R E A K E R.com. Get paid to talk about the things you love with Spreaker from iHeart. Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of 43-year-old Tavita Hobbs, who disappeared in November 2008 from Raleigh, North Carolina. Tavita's husband said that she packed her things and left to move to California, but Tavita left almost everything behind, including her glasses and her car, and no one has heard from Tavita since. It was over a year before those closest to Tavita realized that she was missing. Her husband maintained she left on her own. But 14 years later, Tavita is still missing. What happened to Tavita and who is responsible for her disappearance? This is Tavita's story. Before I begin Tavita's story, I have an update for you about the Akia Eggleston case. For those of you who don't remember Akia's story, Akia went missing in May 2017 from Baltimore, Maryland. At the time, Akia was eight months pregnant. Her family reported her missing after she failed to show up to her own baby shower. There was footage of Akia withdrawing money, but she seemingly vanished after that. Her family has spent the last several years searching for Akia, and we tell her story in episode 10. So if you haven't heard the story, take a listen. But on February 3rd, prosecutors in Baltimore announced that an arrest had been made in connection to Akia's disappearance. Michael Roberson, the father of Akia's unborn child, has been arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. Robertson was arrested in Michigan, where he moved in 2017 after Akia's disappearance. And we're still waiting more details about the investigation, but so far, they have released information that cell phone records place Robertson and Akia together on May 3rd, 2017, the day Akia was last seen. They said that all activity on Akia's phone ceased on May 3rd when it was turned off or disabled. Prosecutors say that they were able to determine that the apartments that Roberson had sent Akia a picture of was different than the apartments that he had named. And Roberson had also been dating another young woman at the time who was also 22 years old. And she had just given birth to her and Roberson's second child. It was also revealed that Robertson had been living with that other woman until they had gotten evicted from their apartment. And then after that, Robertson, who was 35 at the time, began staying over at Akia's apartment. And the night before Akia went missing, it was alleged that Robertson and his girlfriend had gotten into a heated argument after Akia posted a picture of her ultrasound on Facebook. 
Investigators had spoken to Roberson over the years, but they claimed that he would be elusive and avoid contact with the police for weeks or months in between interviews, and that when they did speak to him, his statements were contradictory and deceptive. During an interview in October 2021, Roberson told police that he changed his number after Akia's family kept harassing him, but records show he changed his number May 6, 2017, the day before Akia's baby shower. Now, investigators looked at Roberson's search history also, and they found that he made several searches for trash pickup and where Baltimore City takes their trash after it's picked up. Robertson is currently in police custody. Akia's remains have not been located, but hopefully we will get some answers and Robertson will reveal what he did with Akia and her unborn baby so that her family can lay her to rest. Please continue to keep Akia's family in your thoughts and prayers as they begin this new journey to seek justice for Akia. For the families of the missing or victims of unsolved murders, let Akia's story give you some hope to never give up your fight for justice. The story of what happened to Tavita Hobbs is baffling. 14 years ago, Tavita simply vanished, and no one, not even the man she was married to for 17 years, has heard from Tavita since. Not many people know Tavita's story, but her family has never given up trying to find out what happened to her. Like many of these stories, there isn't much information about Tavita's disappearance. In the 14 years since she's been gone, there have only been a few articles about what happened to her. And despite the fact that Tavita was a Navy veteran, her disappearance has gotten very little attention. Tavita joined the Navy in 1982, according to her brother Clinton. And as Tavita grew older, she had begun to express more and more interest in joining the armed forces. And so it was no surprise to her family when she joined the Navy. Clinton told Dateline in 2018 that he and his sister were very close growing up. Clinton was a little brother, but Tavita always looked out for him. He said that they had a huge love for each other. Tavita joining the Navy did change the siblings' relationship because after joining, Tavita moved around a lot. But Clinton said that even though their relationship changed, they still spoke on the phone all the time. It's not clear how many years Tavita spent in the Navy, but I got the impression it was several years. Like Tavita's brother told Dateline, she moved around a lot during her career in the Navy. If you're in the military or a military brat or married to someone in the military, then you can relate to that experience. Throughout the 1980s, Tavita continued her career in the military and eventually met a man named Philip Hobbs. Not much is known about him or how they met, but in 1992, the couple got married. Clinton told ABC 11 and Raleigh that Tavita was very excited to be getting married. The pictures from that day are of a classic 90s wedding. You guys know what I'm talking about. White suits, red bow ties, and big dresses. But what stood out the most was how happy Tavita looked on her wedding day. After Tavita and Phil got married, they moved to Virginia for a few years before they moved to California. And then finally, in 2004, the couple settled in Raleigh, North Carolina. By this time, Tavita had retired from the Navy and was moving on to the next chapter of her life. Her and Phil had been married for 12 years by then, and from the outside appeared to have a very happy, very normal marriage. In all the articles I could find about Tavita, the only person ever quoted in interviews is Clinton, Tavita's brother. I couldn't find any interviews with people who had been friends of Tavita or the couple, so it's kind of hard to piece together what was going on in Tavita's life even after she settled in Raleigh with Phil. We do know that after moving to Raleigh, Tavita took a job working for Salesforce. Now, if you've ever had a job in sales or ever worked a job in sales, then you may be familiar with Salesforce. My last job used Salesforce, and now the name Salesforce gives me nightmares, but that's another story for another time. The job with Salesforce was in Cary, North Carolina, which is about 20 minutes from Raleigh. And Tavita was doing well at her job, but she had made the decision that she really wanted to be a court stenographer. And so while she worked at Salesforce, she was also studying for her certification. Clinton and Tavita remained close despite the physical distance and busy lives. Clinton said that he continued to talk to his sister frequently on the phone. In 2007, Tavita joined her brother Clinton and the rest of her family for a family gathering. But during that gathering, Clinton said that he and Tavita got into a heated argument. 
Clinton doesn't reveal exactly what the argument was about or how it started, but he told Dateline that it was, quote, a stupid argument that blew up and some other frustrations boiled over. I mean, even the closest of siblings argue. I mean, sometimes the people that know you the best also know your triggers, and sometimes they're able to push the right buttons. And sometimes siblings contain hidden issues. You know, their relationships contain hidden issues, and they reveal themselves as they get older. But like I said, I have no idea how deep the issues between Clinton and Tavita were, or if it was really something petty and superficial. But whatever it was and whatever it was about had changed the relationship between Tavita and Clinton, and they had become distant after that. After the family gathering, Tavita returned back to rally, but the frequent calls between her and her brother stopped. Over the next several months, Clinton and Tavita barely spoke to each other. Tavita's mom was alive at this time, but because I could not find any interviews with her, I'm not sure how often she spoke to Tavita over those months. In December 2008, Clinton realized it had been a few months since he had spoken to Tavita. He and Tavita's relationship had been strained, but when Tavita's mother also had not spoken to Tavita in a few months, her family began to become slightly concerned. Clinton said that even though their relationship wasn't in a good place, it was not like Tavita to just not be in contact with anyone for this long. Clinton decided to reach out to Tavita to check on her and make sure that everything was okay. But when Clinton called Tavita, he got Phil on the phone instead. Phil tells Clinton something that he was definitely not expecting at all. Clinton asked Phil, you know, how Tavita was doing. And that's when Phil told him that Tavita was not there because she had left the week of Thanksgiving and moved to Burbank, California. Phil told Clinton that Tavita had packed up all of her things and moved. Now, this was strange for many reasons to Clinton. First of all, Tavita had not told anyone that she had planned to move back to California. Also, Clinton was living in California at the time, so it's odd that his sister would be moving across the country to the same state as him and not say anything. He also said that Tavita had taken a small amount of money and left her car, which stood out to Clinton because Tavita loved her car, so why would she just leave it behind? Clinton knew that something seemed off about what Phil was saying, but what could he do? He really had not spoken to Tavita, and... Phil said that she left. He had no choice but to just wait until Tavita reached out to someone and let them know where she was. Now, at that point, Tavita and Phil had been married for 17 years. They appeared to have a happy marriage. The couple never had any children, and there's nothing to indicate that there were issues in the marriage. However, that, of course, means nothing when it comes to a marriage, because the only people that really know what happens in someone's marriage are the people in it. People often have no problems sharing all the good parts of their marriage while hiding all the bad parts. What you see on the outside of someone's marriage is not always an accurate picture of what their relationship is really like. So the fact that Tavita and Phil's marriage on the outside appear happy and picturesque means nothing because we have no idea what their 17-year-long relationship was really like. Over the next few months, Clinton kept in contact with Phil. Tavita had not reached out to him or their mom. Clinton would call Phil to see if he had heard anything, but he told Clinton that he had not heard from Tavita either. As the months went by, Clinton became more and more worried about his sister. No one had heard anything from Tavita. This was not like her at all. It was one thing for her to not reach out to Clinton. I mean, maybe she was still mad at him, but to stop communicating with everyone in her life completely made absolutely no sense. Now, it's not clear how Phil felt since he has never given an interview about his wife, but he couldn't have been too concerned about his wife of 17 years that left without a trace. I mean, if she didn't want to be with him anymore, then why did she just not ask him for a divorce? It would seem like if Phil was done with his marriage with Tavita, he would at least want a divorce so that he can move on with his life. So if for no other reason, you would think he would want to find her so that he could divorce her. But Phil, unlike Tavita's family, seemed to be unfazed by his wife being gone, and so he never contacted the police to report her missing. In October 2009, Clinton had had enough and decided to file a missing persons report. It had been almost a year since his sister allegedly packed her things and vanished into thin air. 
Clinton called the Wake County Sheriff's Office to report his sister missing. He told them what he knew from Phil about her packing up and leaving on her own. But by the time Wake County Sheriff's Office received the report of Tavita missing, it had been almost a year since her husband claimed he last saw her. The information they had about Tavita's disappearance was limited, and so it's not clear how seriously they took her disappearance in the beginning. They did speak to Phil, but then they closed Tavita's case without really doing an investigation. In February 2010, Tavita's case was transferred to the Raleigh Police Department. And by the time the Raleigh Police Department got the case, no one in Tavita's family had spoken to her in nearly two years. When Tavita and Clinton had a falling out in 2007, he had no idea that Tavita would vanish and that 14 years later, his family would still be searching for her. When detectives in Raleigh began to investigate what happened to Tavita, they would find more questions than answers. Gaps in the diet shouldn't be ignored. Over 97% of women ages 19 to 50 are not getting enough vitamin D from their diet, and 95% are not getting their recommended daily intake of key omega-3s. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin was formulated by exhaustive research to help fill nutrient gaps in the diet of women ages 18 plus. It is formulated with nutrients to help support brain health, bone health, blood health, and provide antioxidant support. But Ritual didn't just stop there. They invested in gold standard university-led clinical trials to prove the impact of Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. The results? Essential for Women 18 Plus was shown to increase vitamin D levels by 43%, omega-3 DHA levels by 41% in 12 weeks. The clinical study was published in a leading scientific journal, Frontiers in Nutrition. A published clinical study is a big deal and a serious commitment to a first-of-its-kind standard in the industry. Ritual is committed to third-party testing from USP and the non-GMO project, traceable and vegan-friendly ingredients, and always clear communication. No shady stuff. I'm so happy I found Ritual. I've tried a million multivitamins in my life, but Ritual vitamins are hands down my favorite. Right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash girlgone and turn healthy habits into a ritual. That's 10% off at ritual.com slash girlgone. For fans of true crime podcasts, Generation Y is essential listening. Host Aaron and Justin cover cases from all angles. They break down theories, dive deep into forensic evidence, and discuss their opinions on the most perplexing cases. In a recent episode, Aaron and Justin look into the case of funeral homeowner Dan O'Connell and his intern, James Ellison, who were both found shot to death in Dan's office. The murder went unsolved. Years later, while investigating a separate case, detectives interview a Catholic priest, Father Ryan Erickson, and he revealed information only the killer and detectives knew about the double murder. Then, Father Ryan hanged himself. With their only suspect now deceased, police and the community grappled with the question left, did a Catholic priest kill two men, and if so, why? Listen to the Generation Y podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. In November 2008, according to her husband Phil, 43-year-old Tavita Hobbs packed her things and moved to California. The problem was, no one ever heard from or saw Tavita again. A year before she vanished, she and her brother Clinton had a falling out, and their relationship had been strained. But when Clinton had not spoken to his sister in over a year, he knew something was wrong. When Clinton contacted the police in October 2009, he did not know much, but he knew his sister would not have been away from her family without contacting them. But by the time the Raleigh Police Department got to Vita's case, both time and potential evidence had been lost. Investigators began with the last person to see Tavita, her husband, Phil. When detectives spoke to Phil, he told them a very similar story as Clinton did. He told them that when he came home from work, on the week of Thanksgiving, that Tavita was gone. He said that Tavita abruptly left him because she had found out that he had been cheating on her. Now, it's not clear whether Phil ever told Clinton this, but this was very strange. 
Phil, however, claimed it wasn't strange. The reason he had not been concerned about not hearing from his wife for almost a year was that Tavita did this often. He said that it wasn't unusual for Tavita to disappear for weeks or even months at a time. But the difference is, in those times, Tavita had come back. And this time, she had not. As investigators dug deeper into Tavita's disappearance, they discovered that the last person to hear from Tavita was her boss at Salesforce. When police spoke to her boss, they told them that they received a text from Tavita on November 24th, 2008. The text read that she was quitting her job. Tavita's boss was completely caught off by Tavita suddenly quitting because she was happy at work with her career. And so her just abruptly quitting was really unusual. Why would Tavita just quit her job and via text? For a 43-year-old woman to text her job that she was quitting in 2008 seemed strange to me. I mean, people don't quit their jobs like this. So it's just odd. And Tavita never came back to pick up her last paycheck. The message to her boss quitting her job was the last communication that ever came from Tavita's phone. When the investigators spoke to Phil, he told them that Tavita had packed up a few suitcases and taken her purse. But Tavita had left behind a lot of personal things. I told you earlier she left her car, but she had also left behind her eyeglasses, her diary, her computer, and other things that her family knew that she would have taken if she was planning not to come back. Now, even though it had been over a year since Tavita was last seen, investigators still canvassed the area to see if they could find any evidence of Tavita anywhere. They spoke to people that were acquaintances of Tavita, but no one knew anything. Apparently, Tavita did not have a large circle of friends, and so many people they spoke to could not give them very much insight about Tavita or her marriage. I said earlier that I couldn't find any interviews from friends of Tavita, and according to authorities, she really didn't have many friends. Investigators next checked transportation going out of rally. Phil had told Clinton and investigators that Tavita had gone to California, Burbank specifically. But when police checked there, there were no traces of Tavita ever leaving rally. She had not taken her car, obviously, because it was parked in her driveway. They also checked to see if she had boarded a flight or took a bus, but Tavita had not taken either. Investigators had no evidence that Tavita had taken any form of transportation out of rally. Phil claimed that Tavita had left him because he was cheating on her and that she had voluntarily moved to California to start a new life. But when investigators looked into Tavita's finances, there had been no activity on her credit cards or bank accounts since she left. If Tavita simply left, then how was she taking care of herself? Because all of the money she had had not been touched. It seemed like investigators were finding absolutely nothing. They felt like the circumstances of Tavita's disappearance were very suspicious, and they began to believe that foul play may be involved, but they had no evidence that anything had happened to Tavita. Investigators couldn't find anything about Tavita in the years after she left, but in 2010, they learned some very interesting things about Phil after his wife disappeared. Apparently, in 2009, not long after Tavita left, Phil packed up their home and moved in with a woman that he had been seeing. Court records show that Phil had only lived at the home for a little while and that in February 2010, he violated a domestic violence order. He was set to appear in court in March of 2011. Now, what are the possibilities that whatever occurred between Phil and this new woman was an isolated event? In later 2010, after Phil moved out of the woman's house, investigators were able to obtain a search warrant, and they were hoping, you know, that they were going to be able to find some information about Tavita in that house or some information about where Tavita may be. During the search of the home, they seized Tavita's computer, two pairs of eyeglasses that belonged to her, and her personal journal. They also seized several photos of Phil and Tavita and mail that belonged to Tavita. Investigators also searched the home where Tavita and Phil had lived, but they had found nothing inside their home. They had used ground-penetrating radar to search areas around the home to see if they could find any evidence of a body, but 
they were unable to find any evidence in their searches. As the years went by, the hope that Tavita would eventually show up faded. Clinton, her brother, began to settle with the idea that his sister was no longer alive, and investigators agreed. There had been no activity from Tavita in years. She had not used her cell phone since November 24th. There was no activity on her bank accounts, no employment records, nothing. Investigators found it hard to believe that Tavita would have just left on her own, and they did not believe that she really had the financial means to just start a new life. Like many of the stories I tell, Tavita's story has not gotten much attention. Granted, this is an unusual case because Tavita had been missing for so long before anyone reported it, but the circumstances of her disappearance are still very strange. In 2018, 10 years after she disappeared, ABC News 11 and Raleigh profiled Tavita's story. They spoke to both Clinton and the detective working the case. The detective said that he found Phil's response to his wife's disappearance odd. He said that, quote, I would have expected to see a report filed by the husband. I would have expected to see some cell phone activity between the two phones. I would expect to see attempts to locate her. But none of that had occurred. It's hard to understand how you could be married to someone for 17 years and then not care that you had not spoken to them for months and then years. This is not typically how divorces or separations go, and the detective knew that that was suspicious. He went on to say that he believed that something terrible happened to Tavita in Raleigh and that she took her last breath on November 24th, 2008. He doesn't go into detail to explain why he believed that Tavita took her last breath on that exact day. But during that interview, they also interviewed Clinton, who was very emotional. Even 10 years later, the pain is still very present for Clinton. He said this. 10 years into this, it's like, I, I, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. But I'm trying to deal with it. He said his mom called him all the time to see if he had found out anything about Tavita. She calls me in a panic. She calls me asking where she's at. She calls me. She goes, have you talked to your sister? Have you talked to the police? Has anybody called you? When covering the stories of missing women, the pain of not knowing is something that exists for all of their families. For Tavita's brother, it's probably even harder because he and Tavita were not on the best of terms before she disappeared. Her family is not even sure what day she exactly went missing. And for that matter, neither do the police. The last communication from Tavita's phone was a text message to her boss quitting her job. But that could have been anybody texting from her phone. There's no proof that that was actually Tavita. The only person who knows what was really going on with Tavita is Phil, and it's not known how helpful Phil has been to the investigation. But in 2019, investigators got what seemed would be a big break in the case. In January of that year, investigators spoke to a family member of Phil Hobbs, and during that interview, they told investigators that sometime after Tavita went missing, Phil buried a gun in the woods behind the home of another relative. Based on what the relative told them, investigators were able to obtain a search warrant. But instead of searching the area immediately, they decided to set up surveillance cameras. They wanted to see if anyone would come to get the gun first. Now, they watched for a month, but no one ever came to the woods. Now, they later told ABC 11 and Raleigh that the warrants and their surveillance had turned up nothing. Clinton was disappointed when the new information did not find any evidence about what happened to Tavita, but he was hoping that this was a sign that people were going to start talking. Like the detective said, someone knows something and they know what happened to Tavita, and maybe time will weigh them down and they will finally tell the police what they know. After 2019, I couldn't find any articles about Tavita or any updates about her case, But in the last interview, detectives said that this case was still open, and so I assume they are still working on Tavita's case. But after 14 years, they need someone to come forward. For 14 years, Tavita Hobbs' brother has carried the pain and regret from his sister being missing. 
A petty argument that he is sure they would have gotten past festered, and when she vanished, their once close relationship was no longer as close. He has had to spend 14 years searching for his sister and trying to bring her home. Well, Clinton has accepted the possibility that Tavita is dead. He just wants to be able to lay his big sister to rest. Nothing about Tavita's story makes sense. Phil's account of what happened makes no sense. But at this point, unless someone comes forward, investigators will continue to have a very difficult time finding out what happened to Tavita. When Tavita went missing, she was 43 years old. She would be 56 years old now. There is still hope for Clinton and his family that they can get answers about what happened to Tavita. And I hope someone will come forward and say something. It's time. Tavita Hobbs went missing in November 2008 from Raleigh, North Carolina. If you have any information about the circumstances of her disappearance, please contact the Raleigh Police Department. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We will be back next week with a brand new story. Join us on Patreon for exclusive mini-sodes and ad-free episodes. As always, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Black Girl Gone Podcast. Listening on Apple Podcasts? Show your support for the show by leaving a review and a five-star rating. Give us your attention, we need everything you got fast Waiting on reparations, we be the illest podcast Tune in every Thursday, politics and wordplay We fight for the people cause they got us in the worst way From the hill to Brazil, Bombay to Kanye From the left enclave to what the neocons say Every Thursday, cop the heady conversation And, and break us off with some bread cause we waiting, waiting on, on reparations. reparations Listen to Waiting on Reparations on the iHeartRadio app Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts The Gangster Chronicles podcast is a weekly conversation that revolves around the underworld. From criminals and entertainers to victims of crime and law enforcement, we cover all facets of the game. Gangster Chronicles podcast doesn't glorify or promote illicit activities. We just discuss the ramifications and repercussions of these activities. Because after all, if you play gangster games, you are ultimately rewarded with gangster prizes. Our Heart Radio is number one for podcasts, but don't take our word for it. Find the Gangsta Chronicles podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. What's up, guys? I'm Rashad Bilal. And I am Troy Millings, and we are the hosts of the Earn Your Leisure podcast, where we break down business models and examine the latest trends in finance. We hold court and have exclusive interviews with some of the biggest names in business, sport and entertainment, from DJ Khaled to Mark Cuban, Rick Ross, and Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, our alumni list is expansive. Listen in as our guests reveal their business models, hardships, and triumphs in their respective fields. The knowledge is in-depth, and the questions are always delivered from your standpoint. We want to know what you want to know. We talk to the legends of business, sports, and entertainment about how they got their start, and most importantly, how they make their money. Earn Your Leisure is a college business class mixed with pop culture. Want to learn about the real estate game? Unclear as how the stock market works? We got you. Interested in starting a trucking company or a vending machine business? Not really sure about how taxes or credit work? We got it all covered. The Earn Your Leisure podcast is available now. Listen to Earn Your Leisure on the Black Effect Podcast Network, iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.